So there was an opposition. I feel like a fool for not thinking about that possibility. Of course, there would be people who don't agree with the current government, because are there always? Even more, Format Eba told me, these seem to be loyalists to the show line, so they were supposed to be on my side. Eba had managed to find out a time, location and even passphrase for their next meeting. So Milia and I went. Passphrase proved true, and we were led into the inn's private dining room, where I, with shaken knees, mind you, announced who I am. <gasps> this is Nidak, my adventure. Written down in a better way than I can tell it. Episode 44 The Wobbly Wine Glass The inn's sign moved in a light breeze, like the name it depicted. This is it? Nedek said to Amelia. Are you ready for this? Milia gave her a tight smile. I believe the question is if you are ready for this. It is the question of how far you trust that Apa woman and her information. It could be a trap. Nirak rolled her eyes. It wasn't the first time Milia had said that. The worst thing was, she could be right. The meeting they were about to intrude on could be either a bunch of people who would adore Nirak or who would kill her at the first opportunity. Nidak chose to believe Eva and squashed down on a small pit of uncertainty again. She would act like the queen she was supposed to become. Her first performance in front of an audience. I got this. She opened the door. The uncovered candles of the plain chandelier in the middle of the room flickered with the gust of wind entering as she and Melia stepped inside. Being nowhere near the square market, the inn didn't have many patrons. That in itself wouldn't have accounted for the low attendance, but its location was outside of the fort district. Apparently, although the festivities were celebrated everywhere in the city, centering mostly around the markets, the fort district was the most popular it was a section of the city in between the four-cornered walls and the three-cornered walls where the castle stood. A group of four sat in a corner, playing a game of dice. There were a few loners spread about, staring at their cup. Nirak felt out of place with the fancy new dress she wore. She'd been astounded to hear the seamstress had already managed to finish one of the dresses Melia had ordered that same morning. When Nedek had asked how that was possible, Melia merely smiled and said mysteriously, It's a secret of the trade. The serving woman, about Nedek's age, stopped cleaning cups for a moment when she saw them enter. She recovered and hid her surprise quickly enough. Good evening, fine ladies. What can I do for you? We are here for a dive in history, Milia replied. The woman kept her smile, but Nerak saw it slip a bit. Despite that, she told them to follow her. She led them to a door at the side of the room, knocked a specific pattern and held it open for them not even bothering to speak to the people inside first. Nedak and Melia shared a look before Nedak braced herself and walked in. The person stood with her back turned towards the door. The other people, all seated, stared at Nedak, prompting the standing woman to follow their gazes and fixing Nedak with a hard stare. What's this? We did not expect any strangers today. Tamsi, you did not warn us about new members. A dark-haired woman uttered an uncertain sound, but Nirak didn't give her the chance to speak. She pulled herself up, squared her shoulders, and lifted her chin. Flutters in her stomach almost prevented her from speaking, but she managed it without stuttering. I am Nirak Isho, 
and I am your future queen. The throne was taken from my parents. I am here to reclaim it. In eight days, the wooden water crown will fall on my head, and I heard you are the group of people who have been actively aiming to stop Pagewin, or, really, the order of the end, from getting it. You are my people. A gasp behind her preceded the sound of the closing door. For that matter, there were a few gasps in front of her too. Some people stared at her wide-eyed. Others had an open disbelief painted across their faces. The old woman, who still stood up, eventually spoke. Nidaki show. So it is true. You are here in this city. What are you doing, child? You should not be here. Hide somewhere away from here and let it all happen in safety. Why risk your life? Would you want a queen who'd rather cower and hide? Or would you want one who isn't afraid to fight for what she believes in? I can't go and hide. I have a prophecy to fulfill and people to convince to love me. I have a queenly reputation to make. The old woman nodded and showed a slight smile. Had this been a test? Nidak thought her heart would beat out of her chest, and if she didn't sit down soon, she'd surely pass out from the anxiety of having to appear confident. Please, sit, said the woman, pointing towards a high chair close by, maybe her own chair. Nidak didn't protest. It was all part of the confidence game. We are very pleased you could join us. And from the moment the prophecy dropped, we'd been hoping, no, dreaming. It meant you were here. And you truly are. It is quite remarkable. I apologize how rude of me. I should introduce everyone. I am Rietta Oyelope. This fine gentleman here is... She went through the whole room, pointing to everyone around the large table in turn. Nina did her best to remember all the names and faces, but she knew it was a lost battle. There were a few who stood out enough to have more chance of remembrance. A tall and broad-shouldered fellow, his posture hunched, as if he tried to hide. He would never be able to do that with his large figure. A normal-sized and fairly unnoticeable man, but well-dressed, somehow caught her attention while Rietta introduced him as Graham O'Brani de Vermont. She didn't know what drew her to him, but something tickled her mind. Rietta said he had been in an unfortunate accident about a year ago, losing his husband and his ability to speak. As she pondered about why Graham felt familiar, Nedek also couldn't help but reflect back on the Rietta's family name. Oh, Elope. Had she heard it mentioned somewhere? And in what context? She couldn't put a finger on it. Rietta kept going around the room, so Nedek snapped out of her thoughtful state. She was pleased to see there were more women than men. One of the men was Nedek's innkeeper. She hadn't seen him when she first entered, nervous as she was. Now, at the introduction, it was obvious. So my aunt hadn't been lying when she called you a proud Isho supporter. Nedek grinned at him. The man obviously didn't know what to do, and ducked his head several times, stammering apologies for not knowing who she was, and if she wanted a larger room, and nonsense like that. Neda couldn't believe it. Was this how people would treat her once they knew who she was? All the groveling and silliness? She tried to calm him down, but the more she talked to him, the more she seemed to panic. 
Perhaps he was remembering the times he'd given her the side eye. Ignoring him may be the best course of action. Nidak turned to Rieta and invited her to continue. When she'd received everyone's introduction, all thirteen names flowed together in Nidak's mind. She scolded herself. She'd have to practice tricks to remembering names and faces, because she wouldn't want to be known as a queen who didn't care. Well then, Rieta continued, if you truly are who you say you are, I want to wish you a warm welcome to the truth, companions. However, and I apologize to have to ask you this, I'm afraid we do need proof that you are the real heir. Nidak nodded. She expected this to happen. Forcing a smile on her face, she placed her hands on her knees and said, I'll be back. She skipped to her room in the inn. She cuddled Kitty and chuckled at the dazed expression on the cat's face. Sorry, buddy. You go back to sleep now. She kneeled in front of her bed, placed a smooch on his forehead and gave him one last stroke. And another one. Bending further down to the floor, she reached under the bed and retrieved her halberd. It had been two days since she held it last. A comforting weight in her hands lifted her heart. The dress didn't hinder her when strapping the harness on her back. Nirak reminded herself to give Melia extra praise. Somehow she had managed to convey certain things to the seamstress to help Nedak with skipping and the halberd. It made Nedak wonder what other practicalities the dress hid. Reappearing in the private dining room, it was clear she interrupted the companions having steaming discussions. They quieted. Nedak would ask Melia later about what had been said. It may be important to remember who showed immediate faithfulness and who doubted it all. Is this... Rieta stepped up to Nedek, who had held out her halberd for all to see, the shaft fully extended. Power-pooped weapon. Nedek finished the woman's sentence. Wiping her cheek, the woman looked each of her companions in the eyes. She turned back towards Nedek, gingerly touching the halberd. Using it as a support, she knelt on one knee. In a voice clear and strong, but trembling slightly from emotion, she spoke. My future Queen Nedek is sure. I have and will always be faithful to the Isho line. I hereby swear to follow you in all things and uphold the values you treasure. Here forever and eternity, that I swear, Rietta Oilope, right to the day I die. Other voices had joined her straight away. When Nirak took her eyes away from the wondrous sight of an old woman swearing fealty to her, she saw everyone had kneeled and spoke the same words. Her following had just quintupled. Rietta's name still tickled something in the back of her mind. As Nirak helped the woman up, she asked, Your family name sounds familiar. Excuse me for asking, but would you maybe know why it does so? She quenched at herself for the formal way she spoke. Rietta's eyes had a twinkle in them, not only caused by the remnants of the earlier tears. Of course, I believe I do know why you may have heard of it. I do not know how long you have been in this city, nor how much you know, but you did mention Lord Pagewin before. So, you are familiar with him, the one who sits where you should sit. At the mention of Winnie's name, 
Nedek knew, vaguely. Lord Pagewin is my grandson. You have been listening to Nedek, Chapter 44, The Wobbly Wine Glass. Narrated, adventured and lived through by myself, Nedek. Written in a better way than I can tell it by Astrid Jeff. Don't go just yet. We've got bloopers coming up. Nedek. <clears throat> Nedek. <clears throat> the worst thing was... The worst thing was... Oh, fuck. The worst thing was... She could be right. Oh, come on, Waffle. What are you doing? Okay. What's this? What's... <clears throat> A dark haired woman uttered an answer. Nedek did her best to rem. Nedek. <coughs> Nedek. <coughs> Fuck me. Nedek. Nedek did her best to remember. Bending further down to the floor. She. What are you doing? Hello? It's because I'm talking about cats. Hello. Oh, you are coming? Okay, hello. Yes, that's my mic. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Yeah, you can lay down later. It's good. There you go, buddy. <clears throat> Reappearing in this... Oh, fuck's sake. Come on, buddy. Come on, up. Come on, up. Don't work on the computer, okay? They quieted it. Nedek would ask Melia late. <coughs> Rietta stepped up to Nedek, who had held out her halberd for all to see. Rietta stepped up to her, wiping her cheek. Wiping her cheek, the woman looked each of her companions. Oh, fuck's sake. Chopper, stop it, dickhead. Come on. Awful. Oops. Sorry, buddy. Wiping her cheek, the woman... Oh, fuck's sake. Can you stop being a dick? <laughs>